morning. Today I have the pleasure of bringing you the scripture, Psalms 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship him and bow down. Let us kneel before the maker, our Lord, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Messiah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Psalms 95. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Alina, for stepping in, too. I know it's difficult, but we have them eagerly step in. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. We thank you for your word that is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to divide even soul and spirit, bones and marrow. Lord, it does expose our hearts. So expose our hearts and our intentions today, O oh Lord. Fill us with your spirit, fill us with your, your word, for your word is Jesus that has lived among us and Jesus that will never forsake us and Jesus that will guide us home. Thank you for the wonderful hymns and choruses that we sang that, sang the, that said the same message as, O oh Lord. Help us not to live a life of complacency or, or a life that lives for our own, but to love and serve Jesus and him to grow sweeter and sweeter every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll go ahead and warn you. I might be longer. Just saying, might be. I didn't apologize or anything. I said, I'm warning you. So stretch, get ready, because I'm going to try to cover a, as much as I can of Hebrews in three weeks. We're going to try to make it through chapter four today. The reason that I chose Hebrews to read after reading Mark's gospel is because Mark's gospel came up and said, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say that I am? And you have to answer that question. And if you read God, uh, Mark's gospel, you'll see that he is the son of God. This is the good news that's being told. It's contrary to the gospel that the world preaches. But it also says that Jesus is a suffering servant. And you're supposed to take up your, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Him. And that's difficult. That's hard. That's not something we want to do. It's something we can't do on our own. It's something that only we can do with God's power. Even when Peter saw the young man walk away that looked like he had it all figured out, he, he was the one, if anybody would inherit eternal salvation, Peter said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, it is impossible with man, but with God all things are possible. If you read so far, you should be through chapter 6. But like I said, we're going to concentrate on the first four chapters. If you paid attention, you saw that the author of Hebrews constantly quoted Old Testament scripture of one which was Psalm 95. Thank you again, Teresa. We saw that over and over again to give us lessons, and that's one reason we're re reading the Psalms, because if you had anything in those days, you had some copies of the Psalms. They didn't have this. You have this. I guarantee you there are Bibles laying all over the place that need to be opened and read. You have a co the copies on your tablets, on your phone, wherever you want to. When you turn on the television, you can listen to it audibly, however you want to listen to God's message. So you have to think... Am I listening? 
If you hear His voice today, even without picking up the Word of God, you hear His voice, it screams out in all of creation. But even more when God is talking to you through His Word, through His Spirit. So I want to go start with Mark first, okay? Not you, Mark, or you, Mark, but the Gospel of Mark. And reminds you of a couple of things. That the world thought that Caesar Augustus would be the Savior. That the, the things that they were getting from Rome, the road systems, everything else, they thought that this was going to save them. This is what they wanted. This is what they needed. This is what was going to bring them peace and joy and everything else. But the Jews didn't really feel that way because they didn't want to be conquered. They wanted their kingdom restored. They didn't understand that the Messiah would come and suffer and die. This is just contrary to what they thought. But Mark said, this is the gospel, this is the good news of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And in verse 15 of chapter 1, these are Jesus' words. I'm just going to do a few, and you don't need to turn here because I'm going to go fast, but you can. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. That's Jesus' first words. Repent, change your mind, change your way of thinking so that it changes your heart. And believe the good news that Jesus Christ is the anointed one, the Son of God. Because you're not going to understand this unless you truly believe it. It's something that can only be revealed to you from heaven, just like Peter's declaration. In verse 17, Jesus says, Come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. If we skip to chapter 8, Jesus warned them, Be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod because two things are going to fight against Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of man, which is the world, Babylon, Rome, however you want to say it, and believe it or not, religion. Even in denominations in Christianity and everything that say you need Jesus plus or Jesus is not enough. Let me tell you what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell you. Not only is Jesus enough, He is everything your songs that you picked out said that. Jesus is everything. Is that who He is to you? And it should be, He should be getting sweeter and sweeter each day. I titled this Bigger and Bigger, Greater and Greater. I'm hoping you can see where that's going. That's exactly what this trip of your faith, your salvation is supposed to look like, that Jesus gets bigger and bigger, greater and greater. <clears throat> But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Because it doesn't matter about anybody else. It matters what you believe. No one else can save you. You have to believe. By faith you're saved through faith. That's it. But if you have faith, then how can you not live and have works? I didn't say you had to. That's one of the things out there that's contradictory in religion. But if you do believe, how can you not follow after Jesus? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me. Skipping to chapter 10. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for, so, for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were so amazed that they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God all things are possible. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left homes or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now that sounds good to me, that, that hundredfold that I'm going to get and everything, but did you notice that there was persecutions in there also? That's part of the Christian walk. Why would you be surprised that you won't suffer if your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered? And not only should you not be surprised, you should realize that that is what Jesus is calling you to do. All of the Old Testament screams out to, to Jesus Christ being the one and screams out to the fact that God requires a holy people that, that lay down their lives, that do sacrifices for Him. 
Peter, if John's gospel, John Mark's gospel is wrote through Peter's eyes, later writes that we are a royal priesthood, and we'll get into that more next week. The priest was consecrated so that he could offer sacrifices for himself and for the people, and he did this continually because there's no way that we can offer the sacrifices we need, but Jesus Christ did. Wow, he should be big. He did what we can never do. But if we are priests again, we are called to act like the priest did back in the times of the Levitical laws and Exodus and everything. Do you understand this? So, let's put it this way. If you've believed, then you started a trip. Can we say it that way? And you're on a destination. Don't you want to get to that destination? That trip starts with the fact that you believe that the destination that you're going to is worth it. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So therefore, you do something, right? You start your journey. A journey you don't make by yourself. A journey that God makes for you. Wow, what a great salvation. But you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. You've got to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You've got to be saturated with His Word. You've got to realize that you might have to suffer along the way and be persecuted. Here's where we are in the book of Hebrews. Who's the author? We don't know. Who's he writing to? We don't know. You can figure out from the, from the reading as you read along, and it takes about 45 minutes to read the whole book of Hebrews. Some people call it the fifth gospel because it talks so much about Jesus Christ, and really it ties all of the Bible together to Jesus Christ and into our eternity in heaven fully sanctified, being like Christ for all eternity. What a wonderful book. That's why I want to try to get you as deep into it as possible, and I hope that you read along and study it. If you get through with it, read it again and again and again. I guarantee you you'll get something different out of it each time. But as you're reading, you'll learn that this church is suffering. If you're, as you're reading, you'll learn that this church knows much about the Old Testament, so they're Hebrews, they're Jews. As you read that more and more, you'll understand that not only are they fighting a spiritual battle with Herod, the, the rulers of this world, but also with the Pharisees. Because the rulers of this world says, hey, you're, you shouldn't suffer anything. Come out. Don't follow Jesus. That, that, that's crazy. He's not the Messiah. Who would want you to suffer and die? And if you're hanging on to the law and everything there, you're saying, wait a minute, we had a system before that God ordained and everything else. Are we sure Jesus is it? Because He didn't look like the Messiah we thought we would. So they're fighting this spiritual battle constantly to turn away from Jesus. And that's what the author of Hebrews is presenting, present, presenting there. Faith is the victory. Faith is what starts us on this journey. Faith is what carries us through this journey. How is it accomplished? By being anchored to Jesus, knowing that He's great enough, knowing that He will carry you through. By fixing your thoughts, as Hebrews tells us, and fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the author and perfecter of our faith, until that day is accomplished. Now, I've kind of summed up all of it, but then we're going to dig into it. Let me give you the trip example again. You've heard of a heavenly place. And you've decided that's where you want to be. You didn't get saved because of that. You got saved because of the good news of Jesus Christ. But you realize that He is the one that gives you eternal life. He Himself quoted that He could forgive sins. That's why the young rich ruler came up to Him and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a question everybody faces. What happens when I die? And you either fear it, or you have peace, depending on your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But you hear of this heavenly place, and you decide that you want to go. You've never seen it before. But then somebody shows you, maybe grabbed uh, binoculars or telescope, and you say, oh, I got a glimpse of it. Jesus on the cross. And I see that land way out there. So I'm going to set my sights on it. I believe, and I'm going to do something to get there. Board the boat, head, start to sail, read God's Word. Whatever I need to do to do that, that God is doing it through me. Okay? And as you get closer, won't the destination that you're getting to get bigger and bigger? Right? The more you'll long for it. I mean, you went to Hawaii just the other day. I'd long to go to Hawaii. 
It's a warm, tropical place. What do I have to do to go to Hawaii first? Get on a plane. Get on a boat. Whatever it is. I've got to go. All right, so do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him? Do you believe that He has the words of eternal life? This is really good news, even if I have to suffer for it. Of course, I've got to do something as long as I have the breath of life in me, and my life was given to me by God in the first place and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So why would I not live for Him rather than for myself? And why wouldn't I live for His kingdom rather than the kingdoms of men? Is Jesus big enough to complete the journey then? If you believe and you start, will you continue the journey no matter what it takes? Because if you deny yourself, that's pretty tough. But when the cross starts coming into the picture, will you still follow Jesus? That's where this church is at. The author doesn't want this to happen, so he starts writing this letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, if you want to turn there, I am going to go through verse by verse. Verse. I'm using the NIV because I think more of you have the NIV. In Hebrews chapter 1, in the past, in the past, God spoke. Now, I'll try to inflect whenever there's something to do with spoke or say to see how many times that God is speaking to us and how He speaks to us, okay? In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in the last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Boom, there's your start again. Just like Mark said, this is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But in these days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We've already got spoke to in the past, spoken to now, and spoken through the powerful word. Jesus is the word made flesh living among us. This is God's word. You can't get it by doing this. Okay, You've got to open it up and read it. And every time you read it, it is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, Father, open our hearts, our ears, our eyes to see the glory of Jesus Christ. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven after Jesus did the work that God called him to do. Verse 4, So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. Now, take angels again and realize we fight a spiritual battle. When you picture an angel, what, angel, what do you picture? More than likely, you don't picture what they pictured back in that day. You picture a little chubby little thing with wings or whatever, you know. You don't picture a giant in a man's image blazing with fire that when he spoke, the mountains trembled also. He was the messenger of God. That's an angel. Men dropped down dead in fear when an angel came. That's why when the, the announcement was made that the Messiah was here, they had to say, don't be afraid. An angel is God's messenger. He is serving God. He is God's servant. He is great and powerful, but Jesus is greater. Verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. That's Psalms 2. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and each time there's again, there's a, there's a says implied, and here's a says here. How many times is Jesus speaking to you? God speaking to you. He says, do you hear it? And if you hear it, you're supposed to obey. Okay? <clears throat> he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, verse 7, he says he makes his angel, angel spirits and his servants flames of fire, Psalms 104. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. 
You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions, above the angels, by anointing you with the oil of joy, Psalm 45. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same. And your years will never end, Psalm 102. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, Psalm 110. Are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Jesus is greater. Angels are great. They're powerful. They're, they're, I can't comprehend. But Jesus is so much greater. The angels serve Him and bow down to Him. Jesus will never end. He's always been. He is the same. He rolls up everything that we see and know as the garments that we roll up. And He died for your sins. Jesus is greater. And notice at the end of chapter 1, angels are sent to serve us in our walk of faith. Do you notice that? Are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? You don't inherit salvation unless you have faith. You can have all the commandments obeyed. You can be the one that has everything, but you can walk away from Jesus like the man did that day, and you won't inherit salvation. These words are for those who will inherit salvation, who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In Mark 10, Jesus took little children in His arms and He talked about the kingdom of heaven belonging to such as these. Those that believe as a child and trust as a child inherited Jesus' blessings. And Jesus even went on to say that you won't inherit His blessings if you don't come to Him as a little child. Do you understand and believe this? Jesus got perturbed, I'll use that as a word, because of their unbelief that they didn't understand this. He said in Mark chapter 10, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter in it, into it. And he took the children in his arms, placed them in his hands, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you need to have this picture again. This man had everything and he ran up with urgency to Jesus, bowed down to him because he knew who Jesus was and said, what must I do? I've got everything else figured out, but I don't want to miss this point. I want eternal life. Because the opposite is God's wrath upon you for all eternity. And that's what Jesus took away from you. The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up and said, We have left everything to follow you. We've done this. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, no one who has left homes or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution. Don't forget this, because so many times when we're walking down this walk, heading to this place, then we get distracted by it. We say, Why me? Why is this happening to me? Why am I being persecuted? Why is this in my life? Scripture's clear. It's to test you and prove your faith. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. We live in a sinful, fallen world. Praise God that He has not taken His hand off of us. Instead, Jesus is trying His best to put His hands on you and draw Him to Himself. <clears throat> and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, I just read that before, if you didn't notice. I read it again. Because the next verse, as you're traveling along, verse 31, many who are first will be last in the last first. Don't be sidetracked along the way to the kingdom of heaven and think this is happening to you, thinking that maybe this isn't the true gospel or anything else. Because those who are last, who give it up, who do this, will be first. Do you see this? 
you decided to take that trip. You're traveling along. You're getting closer and closer. Is Jesus getting bigger and bigger, more magnificent and more magnificent? Because if He is, you're getting closer and closer to your destination. You're getting closer and closer to being sanctified through and through by the Word and through the Spirit so that you are the image of Christ. If you didn't notice from that first one, it talked about Jesus being the radiance. Not like the moon reflecting the glory of the sun. That's the only reason that we see it. But Jesus is the Father in heaven, the Creator, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is God. The rich man walked away and decided he wouldn't take this trip. Have you believed? Are you taking this trip? And if you are, you've got to be careful not to drift away. Hebrews chapter 2. We, so now it's not just me, it's collectively those who are the church. We must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. What we've heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, all that He said and done, okay? All those things that you read in Mark. Why do we need to be careful what we heard? So that we do not drift away. I don't know what your translation says, but the, the term is a C word term that you're not anchored, so you drift. Drift means to go aimlessly. You're not going to your destination. You're going somewhere, you're being tossed to and fro but you're not heading to your destination. And what happens when you drift? You might lose sight of your destination. You might just be lost at sea. You might be just like, and we'll get to that in a little bit, those wandering around the wilderness who died in the wilderness. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die at sea. I want to reach my destination. <clears throat> Verse 2. For since the message spoken through angels, we'll go back to angels again, was binding. They were God's messengers. And every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. What do I deserve? The punishment that Jesus received on the cross. He was a man that was unrecognizable, Isaiah said, because of the beating that he took for you. He was mocked, falsely accused, I cannot imagine, and he went through the most humiliating torture known to mankind. And he willingly gave up his life. He willingly did all that when he could have called down angels to take him off because he wanted to save you. God poured out his wrath on his son and abandoned his son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you could become God's child. Wow. Verse 3 then. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? It is something that requires action. That's why we're going to get into James. And James says, if you don't have action, I don't believe you. Writing to the early believers again in the church. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it changes you. You are a new creation in Christ. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. Verse 4, God also testified all these things of speech of, of us hearing God's words. He did it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Verse 5, it is not angels that He is subjected to the, wor the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Notice this transition. We already had angels aren't the ones that you should be thinking highly of or anything else. Jesus is above all that, and Jesus was fully man. And what Jesus has done as a man, He expects you to do as a man also by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live that holy life that we were created to live and have dominion over this world in the beginning, to walk with God. And now we can again because of Jesus. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man, one of the terms that Jesus used, that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels us and Jesus. You crown them with glory and honor, and you put everything under their feet. Psalms 8. Our design is to rule over this world and worship God, to thank Him for it, to walk in communion with Him. But we did what? Disobey. 
because of the man who did not disobey and suffered and died, we can be put back into a right relationship with God and live on this earth, bringing the kingdom of God into, into this earth until Jesus brings it in and reigns eternally. We are Jesus' hands and feet. Okay? In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them. Verse 9, but we do see Jesus. That's why I gave you the trip analogy to start this out. We didn't know about Jesus before. We couldn't see Him. But then one day somebody told us about Jesus. And we saw off in the distance a hope firmly grounded in heaven because we believe in Jesus Christ. And we believed and we started this journey. And now we're on this journey, and it should be the destination we're getting to, and Jesus should be getting bigger and bigger. If not, we're roaming around aimlessly adrift. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor. Why? Because He suffered death. So by the grace of God, He might taste death for everyone. Is this what you believe? In verse 10, "...and bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what He suffered." There it is again. Do you believe this? Verse 11, "...both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is then not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters." We are a brother with Christ. We are God's child. Let me remind you of what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, Jesus just told you how he wouldn't be ashamed. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, Jesus calls himself that, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels, commanding those angels that we just talked about in the previous chapter. Do you see all this? You've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus is making those holy who are in His family. And He is not ashamed to call them His brothers. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. He, Jesus, says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. Psalm 22. And again, He says, I will put my trust in Him. And again, He says, here I am and the children that God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but it is Abraham's descendants, those who live by faith. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. And we'll talk more about that next week. In service, service, he has a duty. And let me remind you again, we are priests, Peter said. That means we have a duty to serve as a priest. <clears throat> in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted... He is able to help those who are being tempted. End of chapter 1, you had that angels are here to minister and serve you. End of chapter 2, you have Jesus is here to help you along this trip. You see this? You decide to take a trip. You decided that it's worth it to go over that heavenly shore over there. You're on your trip, but night comes. You can lose your way. The winds and waves come. You can lose your way. You have got to be firmly grounded, firmly anchored into Jesus. Know where you're going. Fix your eyes on that. Know what your destination is so you don't get sidetracked, tempted anything else, and get, a, get adrift, lost, turned back, or even drowned at sea. Hebrews chapter 3. 
Moses was a great and powerful servant of God. He spoke to God. He even saw the glory of God. He gave the people the law. He led them through the promised land. He led them out of Egypt with mighty miracles and everything, but he couldn't lead them through the promised land because they lacked faith and they grumbled. That generation of two million, roughly, that left Egypt, only two of them entered the promised land. That ought to be disturbing to you. But God was faithful. He gave that covenant to their children and they still entered into the promised land. But those who let the, Moses led out of Egypt grumbled and complained and would not fix their eyes on God. He wasn't big enough. The giants in the foreign land were bigger, right? Joshua and Caleb said, we can go in and get them. No problem, because God will fight this battle for you. But the majority of the people said, no, 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 no. God's not big enough to beat those guys. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share the church again in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. So that day when you decided to follow Jesus, kind of like a marriage day, you know? You decided. You made your vows. In fact, it's called a marriage covenant. If I asked you about your marriage, you might go back to your wedding day. Sad thing is when you ask most Christians about being saved, about being a Christian, they go back to that day. What about how you're living today? That tells me how your marriage is today. Just because you got married, just because you have a ring on your finger, doesn't mean you have a real marriage. Come on, guys, you understand that. I just faced just the other day, I was talking to somebody, and they said, you don't need to park there. I said, why is that? Because the neighbor over there, they're not very nice people. And then you know what the sad thing is? is I saw later that person, and I know where he goes to church. Wow. What do people say about you? Do you look like Jesus in this world? Are you married and committed to Him? Or are you standing on a vow you took that day that you got saved? I'm going to say it again. If you're on this trip, Jesus should be getting bigger and bigger, greater and greater. He should be your everything. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle, a messenger, that's what it means, and high priest, and we'll get more into the high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as May Moses was faithful in all God's house. And we should be faithful. Verse 3, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Don't hold on to the law, you can't keep it. Just as the builder of the house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was a faithful servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future, Jesus. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are His house. Mark that if you mark in your Bibles. We are His house. That means that Jesus is building us into God's family. We are God's family. It's not a future event. It's now and forevermore. Once you believe, you started on that journey. If you don't lose faith, don't get tossed around at sea and don't drown at sea. If indeed we are His house, if indeed we hold firmly to the confidence that we profess and to the hope in which we glory. Otherwise, that wedding vow day may not have been legitimate. Right? Right? So, as the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute, we've had God the Father, God the Son, now God the Holy Spirit trying to talk to you. As the Holy Spirit says, today, as long as you know that it's today, you know that you still have life, don't you? If you don't know that it's today, guess what? You're dead. And if it's today, you need to be listening. Today, if you hear His voice, what? Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. See, that trip that you're on again out in the ocean is like the wilderness. 
You can't see anything around you. All they saw was sand. And guess what? There's two million bodies buried out there in the sand. Wow. More than that. You're out at sea. You can't necessarily see where you're going, but you have a compass. You can ground yourself. You can anchor yourself. And all that is Jesus. And He speaks to you. Scripture tells you that the, the Spirit... It is better for Jesus to leave so the Spirit will come and He will reveal all things that Jesus spoke to you. Verse 9, Where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, Their hearts are always going to be astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, They shall never enter into my rest. That's from Psalm 95. And God's not talking about the promised land. He's talking again, just like Jesus wasn't talking about physical bread. He was talking about this spiritual that you're supposed to see from this, that only you can get by being children that God reveals it to. He's talking about His eternal rest. Because God Himself even rested and set up a Sabbath, so we remember that. Jesus did His work and rested. And when you finish your work on this earth, you will rest for all eternity. <clears throat> Verse 12. See to it. Yours may say beware, take care, be careful, watch out, brothers and sisters, individually and as a body, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But as a body, encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today, why do you do this? So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ. That's why I gave you the example of a marriage. If indeed we hold to the original conviction firmly to the end. Again, if I said my vows to, to my wife and I meant them, then I love her just as much today as I did back then. And it should be obvious to you. Otherwise, there are some things I need to correct. And there are some things I need to correct. I'm a human being that sins. And then I need to get on my knees and make that right. But so many marriages, what? End in divorce, unfortunately. You think they didn't mean the vows that they said that day? You think if they would have said to their spouse that day, I'm going to love you for a little while, but then I'm going to be unfaithful. Uh, I'm going to love you for a little while but then I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to love you for a little while. You wouldn't get an I do from the other partner, would you? You got a wholeheartedly, I do love you. How can you deny that? I love you. Do you love Jesus? What verse was I on? Fifteen? Okay. Sixteen. There's a warning. I knew I didn't finish that chapter, but I was getting close. Who were those, they who heard and rebelled? Were they not the ones that Moses led out of Egypt? Were they not the ones that started this journey to the promised land? Were they not the ones who saw the mighty miracles of God? Were they not God's children? Were they not called out to worship Him? Verse 17, And are they not the ones with whom he is, was angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if it wasn't those who disobeyed? So, we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Whatever it was that caused their unbelief, whether it was they long, longed to go back to Egypt, whether they doubted God, whether they wanted their own ways, and they're in the wilderness. Okay? Not too many temptations in the wilderness. If you've set yourself apart and you live a life where you're fixing your eyes on Jesus, you won't have this many temptations. But if you're in this world today and you're looking all around at everything else, yeah, you're going to be tempted and torn all the time. That's why you've got to fix your thoughts and your eyes on Jesus. If in the wilderness they could say, uh, I don't trust you enough, which goes to disobedience. 
How easy do you think it is going to be for us to be disobedient? We have to fix our thoughts and eyes on Jesus. He has to be everything, or there's a good possibility we will go adrift. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not the ones that Moses led out of Egypt? The ones whom God was angry with for 40 years. Was it not them who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom God swore that they would never enter His rest. It was the ones who disobeyed. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering God's rest still stands. Oh, good thing. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So do you truly believe or you start on this journey? And if so, be careful so that you don't come short. You have to trust and hold firm to the one you love. The one who said, I love you. And you answered back, I do love you also. <clears throat> Remember when you said those vows to Jesus. Verse 2, for we also have the... Ha for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who did what? Obeyed. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Notice that. That says we enter that rest. If you study the, ver the verb usage there and everything, it's now. You're in God's rest now. It's not talking about the, the destination of all eternity. You are God's child now. You live in His kingdom now. You rest in His rest now. But you just haven't seen the realization of completing your work. Got it? So, wow, that brings me peace. It brings the, le the recipients of this letter peace because they're suffering. They're being tempted. They're being torn in two about what, where their faith is grounded. And now I can realize that i got rest right now. I don't care if I get cancer. I don't care if there's, there's turmoils in my life. Yeah, it's going to bother me some, and I'm going to get on my knees and pray more. But I don't need to be worried. Because the worst thing that can ever happen to me is I die, and then the, the, the destination that I long for and live for and hope for becomes a reality. My faith becomes sight. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, so I declare an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. It's the total opposite. You have that rest now. God's rest. And he's quoting from Psalm 95. And yet his work, yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. We're comparing God's rest again. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. Mankind was banished from God's rest when they what? Disobeyed. But because of one man's obedience, a man that had to become flesh and blood, God, then because of his obedience, which meant suffering and dying for you, we've brought back, back into the right relationship with God and we find rest. <clears throat> they shall never enter my rest remains for some to enter that rest. And since those who formerly, excuse me, entered, entered my rest, therefore... Since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, we need to listen and obey, right? God again set a certain day, calling it today. We're full, full circle back to that today. Psalm 95 again. How many times is the author of Hebrews going to quote Psalms 95? Today, this is the day when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage he already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not what? Harden your heart. Because if you harden your heart, you will disobey God and you might not reach your destination. Psalm 95. I probably won't do it as elegantly as Teresa. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. We've come before God, we sing the joys of the Lord, and now we're bowing down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you would hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah, or as they did that day at Massah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me. Though they had seen what I did, for forty years I was angry with this generation. I said, They are people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my way. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. They never knew who Jesus was. They only saw a glimpse of him from Scripture again. The tabernacle was a design, a copy of that in heaven. Now that is where Jesus sits and he's our advocate still working for us. His spirit is here still working in our advocate for us. That we are God's children and we are priests. Back to Hebrews. Verse 8. For if Joshua, and I love this, I always say it because he's the son of none. <laughs> for if Joshua... It's spelled differently, N-U-N. Had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day, today, when you're hearing about His Son, okay? <clears throat> there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God rests also rests from their works. Got to work first just as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Now you know the next verse, right? Everybody in here know it? Pretty much. I mean, you might not quote it exactly. And man, my problem is when I go quote scriptures, I learned it in King James and now I read everything different so I get confused. So let's see if we can do it. For... Okay, wait a minute. We're going to go back to that four in just a minute because that's a prepositional phrase tying everything together that we just learned. For what? The Word of God is alive and active, powerful, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And what's it do? Judges, ooh, judges what? Hearts and intentions. Whatever you've got your translation, there's your, your basic. So for, for what? All this that we've just talked about. Christ is greater. He is the greatest thing, period. If you believe in Him, God is speaking to you. He spoke through angels and through prophets. He speaks through Jesus. He speaks through His Spirit. Come, come to the throne room of God. Come, praise His name, come worship Him. He is the one that gave you life in the first place. And if you believe in Jesus, He's given you new life, eternal life, and He will give you rest. Do you believe all this? For the Word of God, everything that encompasses God speaking to you, this written word, Jesus Himself who became flesh and blood, the Spirit speaking th to you. So you've got to read it, listen to it, hear it. doesn't come through osmosis again. So that you can hear and obey. So that you won't be adrift. That you will reach your destination. Because don't, don't let the world lie to you. This is still alive and active. It's still necessary and relevant. It's still the Word of God. Alive, that means it's living and working. It's active. You'll, every time you read it, you're going to see results of it. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. We, we, you, ooh, all these other scriptures are coming up about the Word of God and it, it being the sword of the Spirit and everything. It cuts in and it cuts out. And it penetrates so deep that it goes in and divides what I don't even understand what's the difference between soul and body. I understand enough that I am a soul with flesh and blood on me. And Paul said that we're going to get a, this is a tent. I'm going to get a, a, a forever body to dwell in. But I can't comprehend all those things. 
But the Word of God divides those even in two. To the joints and marrow, I can figure that out a little bit more, but I'm, I'm not got a degree in medicine enough to know that. But it, it divides what is man that God would be mindful of them. It judges. Whew, thank goodness it does before God judges me. The thoughts and attitudes of my heart. If I'm going to let Him be God, if I'm going to pray to my Father in heaven that His will be done, that His kingdom come, if I'm going to be satisfied with daily bread, if I'm going to forgive others as God forgave me, if I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross and follow after Jesus. It's a day-to-day -day walk, journey, that you started on when the one that said, I love you, said, do you love me? And you entered into that covenant agreement. And it's something you can't do on your own. God does it through you as you deny yourself. Take up God's word which will tell you that you need to live for Him. And you follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Literally being His hands and feet. But there's another verse after 12. It's 13, right? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Don't think you will escape it. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before His eyes, before the eyes of Him to whom we give account. You are accountable for every breath you take. Therefore, you got another key word there transitioning you. What should I do then? Since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, the one who suffered and died for me and is continuing to be my advocate in heaven, continuing to work for me, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. I said I do that day. My marriage should look as though I love that day. If it doesn't, I need to make some corrections. You can tell them if I do anything or not. Because <laughs> they all know I need to make corrections. But that day, I remember sitting on a hillside in uh, Helen, Georgia, at a little white church. Don't you ever leave me, because I love you, and I am putting myself bare and naked and exposed, and I fear that you might leave me, because I am in love with you, and you are what matters this day. Now, you asked me another day if that was the same feelings? Not necessarily. But hopefully it comes around to that and I fix my eyes back on the one that I chose to love. And I commit to my relationship because of that. Oh, the one who loved himself and gave himself for me. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. No matter what waves you're facing, no matter what you can see in your life, Jesus is the way for you to find home. You can approach, verse 16, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time at need. So we're on that journey, and the author of Hebrews says, I do not want you to get lost. Jesus is everything. Put your thoughts, focus everything on Him, love Him, and you're going to do it by grounding yourself in God's Word because God will reveal more and more of His love, reveal more and more of Jesus to you, there is literally no way you won't reach your destination if you study God's Word. I don't know if you noticed it. I told you a little bit. At the end of chapter 1, angels are here to help you on this journey. Chapter 2, Jesus is here to help you on this journey. Chapter 3, the Holy Spirit is here to help you on this journey. Chapter 4, even God's mercy and grace will help you on this journey. If God is with us, who can be against us? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are an awesome, mighty God worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. Forgive us for when we fall short so many times. We thank you for your faithfulness. 
We thank you for your plan. We thank you for your ways that are higher than ours. We thank you that Jesus gave up heaven and gave his life up to save us. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Fill us with your word. Transform us through and through that we may offer sacrifices that are pleasing to you. And that does mean our lives, Lord. We thank you and praise you. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and that he is still our advocate in heaven. We thank you that the, the Spirit will guide us and direct us and is just a taste of that future glory that we will share. Lord, grow your people into the people that will bring you glory and honor. We thank you for this church. We thank you for each and every believer here. Examine and judge our hearts through your word that we might not sin against you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.